right, if I could have your attention, I'll get started. Thank you. Um, first, a couple of announcements. Um, this is the 90th, I think I want a, a round of applause. It's the 90th series of What Business is Do. That's, that's exciting. Um, and I see Joe isn't isn't here today, but um, uh, Lynn is, and 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 Gordon is, and so we have uh, the long history of the department of offering this to the public, of offering these experiences to our students, both uh, physics majors and and non majors. Uh, it's something unique about this campus, uh, something that we're very uh, proud of, and and uh, I know for one, it had had something to do with me saying this is a a good place to. Uh, to roost, I guess. I um, wanted to give you a, an idea that we have an exciting lineup in store, including Dr. Uh, Vim Lehmans, who will be discussing tabletop particle accelerators. We'll also have Dr. Surya Gangli uh, discussing neurophysics this semester. Dr. Norbert Werner will be peering into the beating heart of galaxies. And uh, Dr. Austin Roeder will be peering into the living human eye with adaptive optics that you all know is near and dear to, to my heart. Uh, and much more. I want to say that uh, uh, at the end of this week I'll have the full poster up, uh, both online, and I'll print a few out. I know some of you like to have the um, poster in your hands, so I'll have that um, printed up for um, next week. Next week we're going to catch up on the fascinating world of Pluto as seen from the New Horizons spacecraft um, with the video direct from Pluto. Um, so. We're going to be watching that, and I'll prov uh, provide some uh, later results um, that have happened uh, just in the last couple of months. Um, in the spring, I'm hoping to bring in a, a collaborator of mine who's, who's actually worked on that project. But it's so timely right now, the summer. This was the summer of New Horizons. This was the summer of discovering a brand new world. Uh, and I wanted to make sure that we, we presented that to you as the audience. Mm -hmm. Um, today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. C.D. Hoyle. Um, he's of Humboldt State University. Uh, he received his Bachelor in Science from the University of Colorado and his Ph.D. from the University of Washington. Uh, we found out talking today, we both worked at Apache Point Observatory. He worked on uh, laser ranging, uh, which you might have some time well, yeah, possibly. to talk about here today. Uh, I worked in near-infrared uh, astronomical instrumentation at the time, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, we hadn't met that yeah. we would recall, but uh, <laughs> it's funny that we have that mm -hmm. in common. He had a postdoctoral position in Italy. He was back at the University of Washington um, uh, before heading to Humboldt State University. Um, his work is experimental work um, in general relativity, as he'll talk about. Um, his work includes students. My first time meeting um, Dr. Hoyle was when he was here for our APS uh, meeting and uh, us learning about the very active uh, group of students you brought down um, working uh, with you very closely. Um, he's uh, speaking today in this, the centennial year of general relativity, so I think he's going to start off with a little bit about the fact that it's 100 years old today, the idea of general relativity. Um, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Hall. Thanks so much, Scott and everyone, for having me down. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, I do have a lot of stuff, so I'm going to get started. So as, as Scott alluded to, I, um, I've done dabbled in various aspects of experimental gravity. And today I'll try to give you a little bit of an overview of general relativity and where we stand as far as um, understanding it. And then talk about some of the work we're doing at Humboldt State to um, basically test general relativity further and look for um, um, signatures of new physics in, in gravitational tests. So we'll just start off with Cavendish's original balance. That's kind of where we started with experimental gravitation in 1798. And we'll see kind of how far we've come from there in this talk, okay? And um, yeah, we do have, a, so a lot of the work you'll see, especially about Humboldt, is, um, is really done by the undergraduates up there. So um, this is um, exciting to get to, to talk about this with everybody. Um, so just as a reminder, right? This is, I'm gonna start off very general. We have um, things that happen at very small scales, right? Um, and those are described by quantum me mechanics. And we have things that happen at very large scales, right? 
and that's generally the domain of relativity, general relativity, gravitation, and we know we have the standard model of particle physics that basically does a very good job of describing things that happen at the small scale um, and, and the quantum mechanical scale. And we have classical physics, astronomy, and general relativity that works on these larger scales. They share some features, such as um, they both work with light energy, space, and time. And you know, one of the overarching kind of goals in physics for the last um, 150 to 100 years has been a way to kind of merge these two scales together, right? Einstein worked for the la latter part of his life on trying to incorporate, um, you know, combine general relativity with the other um, forces of the standard model. And so we'll talk a little bit about that too. And it is 100 years of general relativity and Einstein's theory of gravity. So this is, um, um, again, General relativity, I'll just say it now, has passed every test that anyone's ever put it to for the last hundred years, okay? And so it's an extremely <laughs> successful, yeah, oh, there we go, <laughs> extremely successful theory of gravity. And um, so the question is, why do we want to test it further? And we'll come to that a little bit too, okay? And I, I'm happy to field questions on the fly too, if you want, but we'll save them until afterwards. I don't know if we usually do, so. And just as a quick reminder, right, um, there are four known fundamental interactions in nature. There is a strong nuclear force that holds um, nuclei together. And if we just characterize its strength, we'll just call it one on some arbitrary scale, okay? And its range is about, you know, over the size of the nucleus of an atom. And then we have electromagnetic force. It's about 100 times weaker, fundamentally speaking, than, than the strong force, infinitely ranged. The weak nuclear force is, you know, about 100,000 times um, weaker than the strong force and acts over very um, internuclear distances. And these are the, and when we have gravity, right? And gravity is infinitely ranged, as we all know, it, just, it basically determines the dynamics of the universe over the largest scales. Um, in terms of its relative strength, does anyone want to guess, or does anybody know, what its relative strength is compared to these other fundamental interactions? It's small. That's, that's a good answer. Um, it's roughly speaking about 10 to the minus 40. Okay? So in other words, if you compare the electrical force to the gravitational force between the, uh, you know, the electron and the proton and the hydrogen atom, you find that the electromagnetic force is about 10 to the 38 times stronger or something like that. And that's something that's actually called, the, it's given a name because it's such a big discrepancy. It's called the hierarchy problem, okay? And generally speaking, you know, uh, when we see a discrepancy like this, we're tempted to say, to ask the question, is there something causing this vast discrepancy of, you know, 35, 40 orders of magnitude? Um, you know, what's the mechanism? Is there a reason for that um, suppression of gravity with respect to their forces? And if you want to convince your friends, I always say, just take something and pick it up, right? And you're using the electrical interactions in your muscles, right? This is all electrical stuff, chemistry, right? And you're overpowering with this amount of electrical stuff the gravitational pull of the entire Earth very easily, okay? So fundamentally, gravity is the weakest known fundamental force, okay, by far. Um, it dominates our, you know, our daily scale, our, you know, it's the main force in our daily lives because it doesn't, um, because it is infinitely ranged and it doesn't average out, you know. On average, there's equal numbers of positive and negative charges in nature, so the electrical force kind of averages out. Gravity is always attractive, as far as we know, and so that's why it dominates our day-to-day our -day experience, okay. Um, these are all forces that are described, again, by the standard model, by quantum mechanics, right? Um, whereas gravity, the theory of gravity, or general relativity, is a purely classical theory, okay? In other words, we all know that in, in quantum mechanics, there's some level of, there's, uh, is determined, the dynamics are determined probabilistically, and um, so we have probability at work for these fundamental forces. This is a completely deterministic classical model, and again, is there some, how can we have one universe that's kind of got classical parts and quantum mechanical parts, the tendency is to want to find some overarching framework that um, would be a quantum theory of gravity, 
okay? And so, but that is not general relativity. General relativity is a classical theory, but one that's, again, stood every test. And so, again, one of the main questions we have nowadays is, um, how can we unify gravity and quantum mechanics? How can we, you know, they really do describe different universes in some sense. And so, can we find a way to merge these harmoniously? And why is gravity so weak with respect to the other fundamental forces? Is there a reason for that? Okay. Um, so an example of unification is actually Newton was one of the first people who, you know, as physicists were always looking to unify and simplify things, even though it doesn't seem that way a lot of the times when the mathematics gets complicated, right? But um, Newton actually was one of the first people to unify, um, in this case, the celestial and the terrestrial realms, because really before Newton, you know, it was thought that what governs the motions of things in the, you know, outside the Earth might be fundamentally different from what the set of laws that govern motion and things on the Earth. There's two different realms. And Newton was able to show that, no, there's really some connection between these two. And basically, as we all know, Newton found that the same force that causes things to fall on the Earth, right, also is responsible for the motion of the planets. And so this was kind of a, a first example of unification in physics. And um, you know, he did this with the, fam with the famous thought experiment where you, you know, throw something. If you throw it very, if you had a big mountain on the Earth, and we have some 1980s graphics today. <laughs> um, if you throw something off a mountain, then if you could throw it at four kilometers a second, you know, it would go a certain distance before hitting the ground. And so it's effectively falling on the surface of the Earth, right? Throw it a little faster, it makes you a little bit farther around, faster yet, and it hits you in the back of the head, right? And so an orbit is nothing more than really just a state of constant free fall. And so he was able to make that connection between orbital motion and falling motion on the ground, okay? And so that was back, you know, in the 1660s, 1670s, right? And if you throw it faster, it'll hit you in the back of the head still, but maybe take a larger orbit. So, Let's just summarize what we know in the 21st century about gravity, okay? We know that it's one of the four known fundamental inter interactions, okay, along with the others that we talked about. Um, we know that it also holds things in orbit and then it governs the dynamics of the universe on the largest scale. So we can take apples hitting Newton on the head and orbits as all part of the same fundamental um, force in some sense. Then Newton, of course, quantified with his famous universal law of universal gravitation, right? And so this is, we've all seen this in our freshman physics class. And it actually is something that we're gonna um, look at in more detail later on in this talk, too. Because there are certain models out there that predict that this might not actually be exactly a two when you look at small enough distance scales, okay? Um, string theory example predicts that this might not be a two when you, when you bring things really close together. So that's one of the things we'll talk about. Um, but this is, was a very successful model of gravity for a long time, okay? And incidentally, this was very successful because the inverse square nature of the force leads directly to Kepler's ellipt elliptical orbits, right? And um, also, all things accelerate at the same rate near the surface of the Earth. Again, that's just kind of things that Galileo was testing, you know, before Newton's time. So that's all fine. We had a very successful model of gravity, but as science, and this is the way science works, right? Um, it was very successful, but it didn't explain quite everything. And so for about 250 years, we had GMM over R squared as the way um, everyone understood gravity. Um, of course, then in 1905, 10 years before general relativity, um, we have Einstein, right? And we've, as hopefully you've all maybe, maybe you've studied a little bit of special relativity, but I'll just remind you a little bit about Einstein's special relativity. So there's two postulates, right? The speed of light is the same to all observers, and the laws of physics are the same to all observers, basically, like, you know, loosely speaking. And those are very um, straightforward statements, but they lead to weird consequences, okay? For example, if nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, and you're on a spaceship, you turn on your headlights, it goes out at speed C, the light it moves away from your speed C. But if you're watching this from the ground, you also see the headlight beam speed away at speed C. So therefore, 
the spaceship could never outrun the headlights and nothing could go faster than the speed of light. Okay? So again, there are tons of weird consequences to special relativity, um, such as time dilation and length contraction and things that you've probably studied in a course along the way. Um, and and we're, we're, we're not really here to talk about special relativity, okay? Which is, you know, often the, the things that you hear about um, and the interesting things um, like time dilation associated with it. Einstein came, you know, published special relativity in 1905, and then he was immediately troubled by this GMM over R squared, okay? And his quest became to figure out how to incorporate gravity into special relativity. Because if you think about it, this GMM over R squared is um, not consistent with the postulates of special relativity, okay? Because in, in Newton's equation, right, we have, um, we have a fundamental constant, big G, okay? Um, it's actually the least well-known fundamental constant, believe it or not. It's got only got a precision of about 10 to the minus 5. And there's actually been a host of recent experiments that get wildly varying values of big G outside the error bars. And so recently, the international code error has to expand the error bar on G because the experiments are in disagreement. So anyway, that's a separate story that I could talk about some other time. Um, and it, but it has to do with the fact that gravity is so weak and hard to measure, actually. Um, we have masses here of objects one and two, and we have a distance. Okay, so if distances and times are no longer um, absolute things, according to special relativity, but you have length contraction and time dilation, the question becomes, who measures that R? Right? That's one way to put Who measures that distance? Distances are not absolutes anymore, right? If you're moving... Uh, in a moving frame of reference, distances look different than if you're at rest with, an object, with respect to an object. So we c this doesn't really make any sense in terms of relativity because we can't say that there is one distance that everybody would agree on. Okay, that makes sense? Okay. Also, there's the fact, so who measures R is unclear, okay? And there's nothing in here that says anything about the time it takes for the force to be transmitted. In other words, Newton's law basically acts instantaneously. If I move a mass on one side of the universe, Newton's law says that effect, the variation in the gravitational force would be immediately attract, uh, you know, transmitted to something across the universe. And that is an example of something traveling faster than the speed of light, which according to special relativity, you can't do, okay? So there's no time, uh, there's no transmission time incorporated in the Newton's law of gravity either, okay? And, and again, feel free to stop me if you have questions, okay? Um, so basically Einstein realized that this, in terms of relativity, was broken and he needed to fix it, okay? And it took him 10 years to do that and basically kind of inventing a whole branch of, or you know, applying a, a whole branch of mathematics to gravity that had never been applied before. And he was successful, okay? So basically to incorporate Newton's law of gravity into special relativity required a massive reshaping of how we understand gravity, okay? And um, this was, became general relativity and it's basically modeling gravitation as the curvature of space-time, right? Or the uh, gravitation as an effect of the geometry of space-time, okay? And um, again, I'm not gonna give you a whole course on general relativity, but let's point out some of its key features, okay? This was in 1915, okay? So almost exactly 100 years ago. So this is a kind of a, a list of things that we know about, more that we know about gravity in the 21st century. Um, Einstein's general relativity um, was introduced in 1915. It basically describes gravity as a curvature of space-time. So if we think about the sun as like a bowling ball put on a mattress or something like that, right? Then the, it distorts the space-time around it. And really the planets like the Earth and Mars and comets and everything are just kind of riding around on that surface. 
kind of like one of those penny things you see in the science museum, right? Where you put the penny in and it spins around. Um, so the Earth is just kind of uh, basically a marble rolling around on this mattress that's been distorted by the sun. Okay? And so everything just kind of follows this curvature. Okay? Um, and this idea of curved space time, we're not going to go into the mathematics of that, but um, it, it's, it's very interesting. And um, I don't know if you have a GR course here. Um, we occasionally do up in Humboldt, depending on if that, we have interest. But, um, and so, um, in essence, Einstein was able to um, fix Newton's GMM over R squared, fix Newton's law of gravity, and incorporate it into relativity. It turns out that GMM over R squared is still a valid approximation when you have small masses, okay? And you only really have to worry about the effects of general relativity on the orbits of, on things like the orbits of planets where the masses are large, okay, and space-time curvature is big. But you don't have to worry about it so much if you're measuring the force between, between say, two bits of matter in a lab, which is actually what we're doing in Humboldt, so we'll get to that later. And so another key feature of general relativity is something called the equivalence principle. Now there's the weak and the strong equivalence principle. Again, I'm not gonna go all into that today. But the equivalence principle basically says that, well, since gravity is just a distortion of the curvature of space-time, everything just follows that curvature, okay? In other words, if this was a mattress that had been deformed by a bowling ball, <coughs> and I rolled some marbles around on the mattress, it wouldn't matter whether they were wood or metal or what they were made of, they would still follow that curvature in the same way. Okay, and this kind of goes back to Galileo's tests even of dropping different things off the Tower of Pisa, right? And they, everything hits the ground at the same time. Everything falls or follows the curvature of space-time equivalently, no matter what it's made of. Okay, that's the equivalence principle. So each of those uh, planets in the yeah. comet yeah. would also alter the space-time. Very but slightly. Not as much as not the sun. Much as the sun. Oh, yeah. You're so right. You're, you're absolutely right. They'd have a little dimple. Yeah. Um, but we're, we'll consider them as test masses in this case, right? So like you think about test charge in an in introductory electrodynamics course, electrostatics course. And so, you're right, and so, um, yeah, so the Earth makes a little dimple that the moon kind of rolls around in as it goes around the sun, too. But actually, the moon is mostly in a solar orbit. If you look at the moon's orbit from outside the solar system, it's more or less following a track around the sun. and slightly perturbed by the Earth. Um, so the equivalence principle, I want you to remember this one, okay, because that's a key feature of general relativity. If gravity is a curvature of space-time, then all things follow that curvature the same way, independent of what they're made of, even independent of their mass, okay? They're, and that means that even light is subject to follow this curvature too, okay? And there's something we'll come back to later, this one over R squared form of Newton's law. In general relativity, has a deeper significance. It's really tied to the fact that there are three space dimensions. Okay, that two in one over r squared is really the number of space dimensions minus one. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. <coughs> and of course, general relativity, as I said, has been very successful so far. Again, there's never been any test that disagreed with this model of gravity, um, and we'll talk about a few of those tests. Okay. Um, another thing about the equivalence principle or the weak equivalence principle is it does explain the, um, okay, it's basically the universality of free fall is another way to say it. And it's basically saying, that it also addresses the question, is the M in F equals MA the same as the, so we'll call that the inertial mass or the mass that resists, you know, um, acceleration when, it's when a force is applied. Is that inertial mass the same as the gravitational mass that comes up in GMM over R squared? And so another way to think about the equivalence principle is if we have GMM over R squared, and we, you know, in a freshman physics class, we equate that to F equals MA to, to figure out you know, what the constant little G is and stuff like that. And in a freshman physics course, we always just cancel those on either side of the equation 
because we assume that the gravitational mass is the same as the inertial mass. Okay, so the, the, F, the m and f equals ma is the same as the m and gmm over r squared. And, or a more technical way to say that is the ratio of inertial to gravitational mass is always constant. That's a requirement of general relativity, okay? That we can do this, that we can cancel those off on either side of the equation. It says, you know, that's a fundamental feature of rel general relativity, okay? Um, again, because everything is just following this curvature, okay? And it doesn't matter, mass is just mass, no matter what, okay? Um, so Newton kind of recognized this, and he, Newton had an equivalence principle that was basically gravitational acceleration is, you can't distinguish it from any other form of acceleration. It feels the same. Einstein kind of has a more slightly technical definition that no experiment could distinguish between an accelerated frame of reference and the effect of, you know, and then the acceleration caused by a gravitational field. And so, in other words, there's no way to distinguish between sitting in a living room on the surface of the Earth and if your living room was in outer space being pushed up by a rocket at 9.8 meters per second squared. Any experiment that you did inside of this living room would give you the same result as an experiment you did in that living room. Okay? Um, and also, you know, free, all, anytime you're in free fall, well that's, there are no forces being applied to you, but effectively gravity goes away when you're in free fall, right? Because if you release something next to you, it just falls with you. And so the state of, anyone that's in a state of free fall is in a truly inertial frame, if we want to get real technical about it. But all, all inertial frames are equivalent, okay? And so, uh, but the main point is that you can't distinguish gravitational acceleration from any other form of acceleration. So there's some classic tests, which we'll talk about real quickly. Um, one of the first things is the orbit of Mercury. If you look at the orbit of Mercury, it actually, um, it does something like this. It kind of wanders around over the years, and its perihelion, or its closest approach, kind of moves from its cycle to the next. And in Newtonian theory, you predict a certain amount of this precession. And in gravitational theory, uh, sorry, in general relativity, um, you predict something slightly different, okay? It was known since the 1850s that this precession of the perihelion was off. Okay, there was a discrepancy. If you applied Newtonian mechanics to this precession, it was wrong. We got the wrong number. And Einstein, so one of the first things he did after he had finished rel general relativity was to um, calculate what GR, as I'll call it, GR, general relativity, kind of shorten it up. W what does GR predict for this precession? And he got this exact discrepancy, he got the exact number. And you know, rumor has it that he um, nearly like collapsed on the floor when he calculated this out. And he found out that this extra, this missing 43 arc seconds per century, which is a tiny amount of angle, um, was exactly explained by his theory, okay? Now one, ex you know, one result like this might be that coincidence, okay? And so let's keep testing it further. There's also the deflection of starlight. Okay, so since everything is subject to the curvature of space-time, light is as well. And light actually would kind of have to follow the curve, a light beam would have to follow the curvature of the, of the mattress with the bowling ball in it too. And um, if you look at the light from a distant star as it goes around the sun, it's deflected a little bit. And this is, you know, called gravitational lensing um, nowadays. Um, you actually get, um, there's a couple different predictions. If the deflection is 1.74 arc seconds, that's GR's prediction. In Newtonian physics, there's actually a, a prediction for this as well. Again, I don't really want to get into that um, too much, but it's exactly a factor of two off. And, um, you know, if, of course, if you didn't see any deflection, neither one of these would be right, right? And again, um, Eddington went out in 1919 to um, basically uh, observe one of these transits and we found that it was exactly the general relativistic prediction which was in disagreement with Newton's law, okay? So there's another kind of piece of the puzzle fits into place here, okay? And this is incidentally in 1919 after the Eddington expedition, 
he had to go out somewhere in the Pacific to measure this transit. I don't remember the exact details. But this is when Einstein actually became famous. Okay? This is when the media kind of latched onto this and was like, wait, now we have this, we have two kind of things that are predicted to be right by Einstein's theory um, that are incorrect by you know, previous classical physics. So he kind of became a celebrity at this moment. Okay? Um, and it, basically it works like this, the light from a distant object gets distorted as it comes around the sun. When you look at a beam of light, you're kind of looking on the, the way it was traveling when it reached your eye. So you might see like an image of the star over here or and an image of the star over here. And so things that were in Newtonian theory in one position kind of get spread out as their light passes around the sun from behind. Again, gravitational lensing. There's some real gravitational lenses actually due to the way general relativity works. If, um, you have these four images are the same object um, being lensed by this object in the middle. So the light comes around and makes, this is from a point source of light, it makes four images, it's called an Einstein cross. So if you looked at, for example, the spectrum of those four images, you would get the same spectrum. This is from the same object. And if you have kind of a galaxy in front of another diffuse galaxy, think something, diffuse objects give you more like rings and so this ring of light is all coming from the same object that's been kind of bent around the intervening one, okay? And so those are real pictures. What about the equivalence principle? Okay, well, people have been testing the equivalence principle in some sense for hundreds of years, actually. If you think about Galileo dropping different objects off the Leaning Tower of Pisa, you could, the equivalent testing, uh, you, could ex, you could say, you could recast that as a test of the equivalence principle by asking the question, are the fall times equal, independent of what they're made of? And um, you can, uh, color is different actually, than it is on my screen, that's weird. Um, and so you could ask the question, are the fall times equal? And you could cast that as a limit on whether the ratio of inertial to gravitational mass is the same for all objects. Again, I'm not gonna go through the calculation, but um, Galileo was able to show that the tra the, if you looked at the difference in acceleration between these two objects, that the fractional difference was about 10%, it was like 10% or less. So he was able to say that these were, they're falling at the same rate to within 10% of one another. That's pretty good. Um, Newton and Bessel did a different test where they looked at pendulums with different masses on the ends and they looked at the oscillation time and you can actually get about a part in 10 to the minus four that way. And so you say, well, I know that these are accelerating the same to within a part in 10,000 by looking at the, the oscillation periods of pendulums, okay? Again, this is all, you know, 15, 1600s, right? And then, then we kind of come to the Etwasch test, which is a lesser known test of the equivalence principle. But it kind of, um, this is kind of interesting because if you hang a pendulum from the surface of the earth, well, the gravitational force pulls it right to the center of the Earth, right? But since the Earth is rotating, there's an F equals MA term that kind of tries to throw the pendulum off the surface of the Earth, shown by this vector here. Does that make sense? And so it's maximal of the equator, because the equator, the, um, or sorry, it's, I guess it's actually <coughs> maximal about here. Because if, if there was only gravity acting, it would fall along this line. Um, but now this, this inertial force kind of pushes it out a little bit, okay? And you can look at this angle eta here and ask, is it the right angle that you would expect? It, in other words, if gravity is affecting this mass the same way as the inertial force F equals ma is affecting it, or you know, as if the inertial mass is the same as the gravitational mass, you can actually calculate what that angle should be. And Etvosh, who is a Hungarian physicist, did a series of tests and discovered that, yeah, they accelerate at the same rate or equivalently the inertial mass and gravitational mass are equivalent at the part in a billion, okay? And so that's getting pretty good. This is, um, he used a torsion pendulum to do that. And we're gonna come back to that later. A torsion pendulum is still one of the best instruments for measuring gravity in the laboratory. And it's incredibly simple. You hang, for example, two masses like a dumbbell from a fiber you bring another mass up near one of them and you look for this thing to twist, right? 
And so the gravitational force, if this, you know, let's consider that these two are very close and this one's kind of far away. The gravitational force, g m m over r squared, would be act between these, this pair and twist the pendulum a little bit, okay? And uh, by the amount that the pendulum twists, you could, um, for example, measure, you know, you know, big G, the gravitational constant, or you could measure the zero square law work and things like that. And so, um, just as a little in review of a torsion pendulum or introduction, I guess if you've never seen one before. This is the fundamental idea between, behind a lot of the modern tests of gravity in the lab. Um, so. At Bosch, who did these equivalence principle tests that we described, that I described before. Um, oh, and then it sounds easy, actually, but it's not at all easy, okay, when it comes down to it. Because there's a lot of other things in the laboratory that might cause a force on this torsion pendulum or cause it to twist, okay? And again, gravity, right, is the weakest of the fundamental forces, so it's the hardest to measure in the laboratory because there's lots of electric charge around and things like that, okay? So this is actually Etbush's experiment. He had a torsion pendulum and he had two different objects on it and he kind of looked how both of those objects were flung off the surface of the earth due to the earth's rotation. And he put different composition dipole pairs, he called it, so different, you know, you have different materials on the pendulum. And he did a whole series of experiments and always found that this angle eta was what it was supposed, was the proper angle. Um, in other words, that the ratio of gravitational and inertial mass was always the same. Now there are some physicists in the 1980s who reanalyzed the Ekbosch data and found a discrepancy. And that caused the whole series of event, which, events, which led to my PhD thesis actually. But <laughs> uh, that's another story too. Um, so, so anyway. Um, people are still testing the equivalence principle, okay? This is the University of Washington's experiment, which was just published a few years ago. Uh, this is my old group where I got my PhD, and it looks more fancy, okay? Um, we still have a torsion pendulum, but we put different materials on opposite sides of it, so we have little test masses of beryllium in this case, and ones of titanium. They put them in an apparatus that, where the whole thing rotates, and if beryllium and titanium are affected differently by anything in the universe, you will see this pendulum wiggle as the whole thing rotates around. I'll let you think about that for a second. But we ro you rotate the whole apparatus around. If there was something pulling on beryllium differently from titanium in one direction, you would see the pendulum wiggle back and forth as this apparatus rotates around. And the uh, Washington group has now tested that beryllium and titanium, along with some other materials, fall equivalently to a part in 10 to the 13. That's actually one of the best tested things in nature, okay, is the equivalence principle. And so um, it's pretty amazing that you can say that, you know, even with laboratory-sized masses, that you, um, they fall equally at that level. So that's quite an accomplishment, actually. So what don't we know? So those are all kind of examples of how successful GR has been. What well, don't we know? Well, GR has passed every test, but it's actually fundamentally inconsistent with the standard model of particle physics. Okay, if you look at the mathematics, they don't really describe the same universe in some sense. And so again, how can we incorporate general relativity and quantum mechanics together in some way? Um, string theory is a leading candidate for that. But string theory predicts a lot of weird things, like extra spatial dimensions, okay? And new particles, and things like that. Why is gravity so weak? This is called the hierarchy, or as I said, hierarchy or naturalness problem. And is it something about gravity that we don't understand that could explain dark energy? And dark energy, again, is the blanket term given to the fact that the universe's expansion is accelerating, okay? Is there something in gravity that we're missing, that's missing from Einstein's relativity that, that could cause that. Because in the end, we don't know a whole lot. We know, you know, that 68.3% of the stuff in the universe is dark energy. We don't really know what that is. There's dark matter that has about 27%. We also have no idea really, what, we have very little idea what that is. Um, we kind of know a lot about this kind of four to 5% of the stuff in the universe. 
And so there are a lot of unknown things out there that might be tied to our knowledge of gravity in some way, okay? And again, there's hosts of theoretical predictions um, and models that, again, we could spend days talking about. So this has kind of been a golden age for gravitational physics and gravitational experiments in the last 15 or so years, 15 to 20 years. And I don't want to go through all of this, but basically, can we find um, effects of string theory in gravitational tests? Can we find un new particles and forces that might have a relationship to dark matter or dark energy? Okay? And there's a lot of experiments going on these days. There's laboratory tests of, of the inverse square law and the equivalence principle, astronomical tests like lunar laser ranging, um, gravity wave searches, um, which um, are very big um, collaborations we're going on now. And also, incidentally, people are looking for signatures of quantum gravity in high energy collider experiments too, like at the LHC in Europe. Concern. And so it's a lot, there's a lot of interest, renewed interest in gravitational physics these days. Um, just looking at short range gravity tests, because that's what we do at Humboldt State. Um, again, we're looking, about, looking to see if are there observable consequences of string theory. Um, because string theory requires extra space dimensions, that in principle affects how gravity works on short distances. Okay? And um, and again, we could, another motivation for testing gravity on short distances is if you turn the dark energy density, if you take that energy density and turn it into a fundamental constant, you get about 85 microns or a tenth of a millimeter. Is there something fundamental that happens when you bring objects within that range, you know, within that distance? Um, you might say that sounds pretty big, right? We've, that's not 100 microns, a tenth of a millimeter, that's something you can see. That's like, you know, a couple of hairs width. It turns out up until 1999, no one had ever measured gravity to even exist between things um, that were separated by closer than a millimeter. So um, it's kind of surprising, but true. And are there new forces or other particles? Um, I think we'll skip that one. And so if we look for um, extra dimensions, so again, this one over r squared law is a, basically a result of three spatial dimensions. If you, and that's because basically how things spread out over the surface of a sphere as you, as you bring them farther apart. Okay, it's just a geometrical thing. And so if there are more spatial dimensions, you expect that two to be different. In fact, if there are n extra dimensions, and as predicted by string theory, and string theory predicts up to seven or eight, depending on who you talk to, um, extra dimensions, um, they might, the gravitational force law at some point when you get a very close small distances would change from one over r squared to one over r to the two plus n. Okay, so it would get stronger at short distances, for example. Um, the way that we model this, and this is just so I can show you a little bit of, um, a little bit about our experiment. Remember potential energy, right? Um, from a freshman physics class. The gravitational potential energy between two objects looks like that, okay? It's one over r. Because when you take the derivative of it, you get one over r squared, which is the force. Um, to test the inverse square law, we consider adding this Yukawa, it's called a Yukawa term, to the potential, which is two parameters, alpha and lambda. And so, basically, if Newtonian gravity, i.e. general relativity, is correct, then alpha is zero. Okay, and there's no extra term here. But if we do gravity experiments and we find that alpha is not zero, then we might be seeing new effects, okay? And the lambda tells you the range over which this happens. Okay, so if lambda was one meter, it means we'd see weird things when we brought masses this far apart. But we're looking for lambdas that are kind of on the tens of micron scales in the experiments we're doing up at Humboldt State. So believe it or not, so I just wanna show you this parameter space, um, this is how well alpha has been characterized over different length scales. So, in other words, the yellow region, and you can think about it this way, in the yellow region, gravity has been shown to be consistent with general relativity. And so, um, this is meters down here, and so we start off like centimeters down, millimeters and centimeters, and we go up to solar system distances. 
And there's a whole different variety of types of experiments that have searched um, for this alpha term over this distance range. We're really talking about the small, the experiments we're doing up at Humboldt State are talking about the small end up here. And so geophysical experiments, laboratory experiments, you know, the orbits of planets give you some constraints on alpha. And so that's generally what we do. We try to see, is there, is this, there this extra term in the potential energy, okay? And in the yellow region, it's been shown that there isn't. In the white region, we don't know, okay? And so, in other words, gravity has never been really tested or even shown to exist um, for, um, over these ranges at these kind of values of alpha. Why? Because it's hard, okay? And I don't want to say much more than that. Testing gravity in the laboratory is difficult because the masses that you're dealing with are tiny, okay? Um, I mean, they're not tiny to us, but they're tiny when you think about the forces acting between them. I mean, if you think about, uh, you have two masses and you have a charge imbalance between them of a few electrons, well, you've swamped the gravitational force, okay? Because now the electrical force is huge compared to gravity. And so when you do these experiments, you have to worry about electrostatics, magnetics. You need to get as much mass as you can at small separations. And you know, the temperature of your room changes and the tilt of your floor changes and all these things can look like a, some new gravitational effect. But really, or just the fact that you have lots of other things going on that are way more, they're way stronger than gravity, okay? So it's very difficult stuff, believe it or not. This was the pendulum that has the most precise test of gravity at short distances. It was built and run by my friend Dan Kapner up at University of Washington. Notice that this is a torsion pendulum, but it does not at all look like a dumbbell on a string, okay? The technology has gotten better over the years. And again, um, I, again, it's a whole talk to go into how this thing basically works. But I just want to give you a sense that gravity experiments really aren't just dumbbells on threads anymore, okay? There's a lot of modeling, of ma basically modeling the, the gravitational force in here and designing the experiments to give you the, the best test that you can at short distances. If you look in the micron to millimeter range, okay, very short ranges, this is how well gravity's been tested. Again, the yellow region, this is all from torsion pendulum experiments, except for the Stanford one. This yellow region, it's been shown that gravity um, behaves as we expect, okay? And so, um, and there's various theoretical scenarios or predictions from string theory on here that where you might see something. But again, I, we'll, we'll save that for the discussion if you want. At Humboldt State, we're designing an experiment that's going to try to push this down a little bit farther and there's to the blue lines. And there's two of them, and I can talk about that later if you want to. But in the best case scenario, we'd get to this bottom blue line and we'd be able to look for new effects of gravity at kind of the 10 to 20 micron distance scale um, and then with a increased precision out at millimeter kind of distances and things like that. Yeah. Um, so this and the plot yeah. earlier has this uh, yeah. versus length scale. Yeah. But you originally put in alpha as this term. Yeah. Saying that it's, it's this deviation. From right. It. And you expect it to kick in at a particular scale. Right. But when I see a plot like this and you're saying we want to explore mm -hmm. these regions, mm -hmm. you're saying that alpha itself may be dependent on lambda. Uh, yeah. On lambda. I'm saying that the range over, the distance scale over which alpha kicks in might be, it could be anywhere in this, yeah, it could be at any range, okay? And it's harder to design experiments that go to smaller values of alpha because the forces you're looking for get weaker and weaker. And as you go this way, you're going to shorter distances, so you have to get things closer and closer together without having extra electrons around and things like that. So it gets very hard as we get things closer together, and it gets hard as the forces get weaker, right? So alpha could be less than one, right, for example. And this is basically saying we've tested, and if alpha equals one, that'd be something that's like gravitational strength in some sense. There's something else that's equal strength to gravity. Out here we've been showing, we've, it's been shown that alpha has to be less than one even, okay? 
And over here in this white area, we don't know. So at short distances and small values of alpha, we don't know. It could, we could have something out there. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Well, the the yeah. last thing you said made me think that if yeah. you've shown that alpha has to be very small, you yeah. still believe it's very small, and so you now have to push into your exclusion yeah. is everything in the lower Here. left. Yeah, which yeah. is in a, which, yeah, well, in down on the right or, or yeah. to the left. Well, we're going to push this yellow region, which is excluded down here, okay? And notice over here, though, at the 10 micron scale, you could still have alphas that are like a million or 10 to the 5. So in other words, there could be forces that are a million times stronger than gravity at 10 microns, and no one would have ever known it because they've never done that experiment before. So that's why it's still an important thing to do, okay? Or at least an interesting thing to do. So here's our HSU gravity lab. It's in an old office. We don't have a lot of space up in Humboldt. Um, but we have our lab that's been going about seven or eight years. We've had about 20 some undergraduates work on this project over the years, about 23 now to date. Um, and I really do treat them like graduate students. Um, they're, doing, they're the ones doing things in the lab. And so I'll tell you a little bit about, I know we're getting a little late, but how our experiment works, okay? We have basically a torsion pendulum that looks actually more like a dumbbell than some of the other ones we've looked at. And we, this is our torsion pendulum here. We have a, test, a mass nearby that's a plate. We move the plate back and forth, and we look for the pendulum to wiggle a little bit, okay? Because there's a gravitational force between this plate and the various parts of the pendulum, which we'll talk about a little bit more. This is our vacuum chamber. That's our student, Holly, who's now working for David Wineland's group at the NIST in Colorado. Um, so she's doing laser frequency cones now. Um, this is our vacuum chamber um, where we access our pendulum down here. We read out the twist of our pendulum with an optical autocollimator that was actually designed and built by mostly by Holly. Um, we'll talk about how sensitive that is in a second. Um, some solid works that my students have put together um, kind of an overview of the apparatus, a blow up of the main part of it. Again, this is our torsion pendulum. This is our attractor mass. It's kind of a simplified setup. In between the two, we would have a conducting membrane that's stretched, which acts as an electrostatic shield to um, prevent any kind of electrical communication between this, ma this mass here and the pendulum. So this copper mass moves back and forth. And notice we've got two different materials here, okay? This is aluminum and this is titanium. And so if titanium interacted with copper somehow differently than aluminum did, as the copper got close, the pendulum would twist. Okay? And as it went farther away, the pendulum would relax to its kind of normal, such normal resting spot. And so if there's some short range interaction between copper and titanium that's different from copper and aluminum, we would see the pendulum do this at the, at the rate that we modulate the attractor back and forth. Um, so that's also a test of the equivalence principle, right? We're basically testing do copper, or sorry, do titanium and aluminum fall toward copper the same way, okay? Now notice that we've also got the titanium over here, so any long range force and gravity is long range, a long range interaction will see equal amounts of titanium and aluminum on both sides of the pendulum. And so anything that's long range really won't produce a twist on the pendulum at all because it'll have the same amount of force on each side. And moreover, if you remember Gauss's law for an infinite sheet of matter, the field is completely uniform, right? And so if this was a really big sheet, even as we moved it back and forth, the pendulum would stay still. And that's an important feature. It's called a null experiment, right? So basically, if Newtonian gravity is correct, or i.e., and whenever I say Newtonian gravity, I really mean relativity. Um, if Newtonian <coughs> gravity is correct, the pendulum basically doesn't twist at all, which is nice, because zero is a nice number to measure, okay? Because zero times anything is still zero, right? And so that's the way it works. Um, I'll skip a little more detailed view of how it works unless there's any questions. But basically, we're looking to see do titanium and aluminum fall toward our attractor mass the same way. And we want to get these to about 100 microns separation. And that's a little bit bigger than the diameter of a human hair. Yeah? 
Would the fact that the titanium on the upper part is <laughs> further from the tractor than it is below, so yes. the distance is actually different? You've nailed an important feature here. Um, yes, the fact that this titanium is a little bit farther than that um, it does give you a very small effect. In other words, if Newtonian gravity is all there is, you do get a very small modulation of the pendulum, but it, it turns out to be tiny and calculable. Okay, so we actually are comparing our twist of the pendulum to that tiny calculated twist. It turns out to be some nano radians of motion. Okay. You're right, absolutely. We just got our pendulums not so long ago. Um, there's the aluminum part that's been polished to an optical, almost op good enough for us, optical finish and the titanium blocks. Very simple setup, really. Um, our student over the summer got our attractor mass drive system working so that we can modulate our attractor mass in a nice sinusoidal way. And there's a reason we want to do it sinusoidally, which I'd be happy to talk about afterwards if anyone's interested. Um, so that was a project over the summer is, is getting, and last year was getting this um, motor to make a nice sinusoidal motion of our attractor mass, as we call it. Um, here's some students working in the lab. There's Holly looking in the vacuum chamber when we had kind of a test pendulum set up. You, there is one hanging here. You can't see the torsion fiber. The fibers that we hang the pendulum from are tungsten, and they're about 20 microns in diameter. And so they're, yet they hold about 100 grams. So it's pretty amazing. Okay. And because here's an example of a fiber. So it's really difficult to make these things, you know, it's hard. You have to crimp the fiber in a screw. It's, it's not really that, the, that, that's not the most fun part of this project. But. One thing I do want to point out is the optical system, which was designed and built by, a really designed, actually Holly found and some other students found a better circuit than the one I was proposing. So they actually did this. And we have just a very, very simple, simple optical lever, lever that we chop the beam and read it out with a lock-in amplifier. But the sensitivity is such that we can measure basically a nano radian of twist of our pendulum. And I gave a similar talk in Boston last fall. And if you want to think about what a nano radian is, if we had a penny out in Humboldt, that a nano radian is the angle subtended by that penny as viewed from Boston. Okay, so that's how sensitive our auto collimator is. And that's not easy to do, and you can't just go out and buy something that does. Well, you can, but it costs about thirty or forty thousand dollars. So, um, and it wouldn't fit on our chamber, actually. So, anyway, that's kind of a, a big um, success for our students was to design that design that system. Here's what our so if we look at our pendulum's motion, it is a harmonic oscillator in the rotational degree of freedom, right? And this is if we pumped most of the air out of the chamber, rough vacuum, so like a thousandth of an atmosphere. There we go. We measure the twist of our pendulum, and it just this is just its free motion. It looks like a damp harmonic oscillator, right? And so um, the period of its motion is about um, 300 seconds. Actually, this was about 40 seconds, a different configuration. And um, you can see it's a nice harmonic oscillator. This is if we pump pretty much all the air out of the chamber. So this is at a billionth of an atmosphere. And now our harmonic oscillator looks like this. And notice the time scale is 100,000 seconds. And so now we're looking at the decay of the oscillation is very slow. So it's a very high Q oscillator, for those of you who studied those things. Um, it's about a Q factor of 3,000. And if we look at the Fourier transform of that motion, we see our resonant peak. So this is, again, amplitude as a function of frequency, right? Um, if, you haven't, if you aren't too familiar with Fourier transforms, that's OK. This is basically the amplitude of the motion as a function of frequency. We see that mo all of the motion is basically happening at one frequency, which is the resonance of our pendulum. And this is just noise down here, OK? And real quick before we end, um, so that's again, that's under rough vacuum, or sorry, high vacuum. We get a nice peak um, for our harmonic oscillator. And we actually able, we ran it this summer with finally with our attractor mass moving. And we, this is the frequency at which we modulated our attractor mass once every 1,000 seconds. Because believe it, this is slow physics. Because the pendulum makes one oscillation naturally once every 300 seconds. 
And so we run off resonance for a variety of reasons that I don't want to go into. Um, but we have our 1,000 second oscillation shows up here. And then we have harmonics of it, which we actually expect to. And so um, due to the um, nonlinear nature of the gravitational force, I mean, right. Um, is that consistent with what our, you know, our residual twist should be from Newtonian gravity? We're still trying to figure that out. I'm sure it's not, because this is one of our first runs. But it's not so far off, okay? Because we have to do a variety. We also have other stuff moving besides our attraction mass. So we need to make sure that we understand the motion that's being induced, induced from everything in there. And so, but we do have a working system finally, which is kind of cool. Um, we're able to control our pendulum with some electrostatic feedback, which is kind of cool. It's a fun student project to write a control loop to do that. We can change the oscillator dynamics in some sense. Um, and so, yeah, so that's where we stand in Humboldt. Unfortunately, I'm out of time. Otherwise, I'd tell you, I can come back and tell you sometime about other projects we're doing. Um, I'm involved in the Apollo project where we measure the distance to the moon to test the equivalence principle or basically ask the question, do the Earth and the moon fall toward the sun as they should according to the equivalence principle? So that's um, kind of cool. We measure the distance to the moon to within one millimeter every night we run that. And then we compare that. Well, the idea is to compare it to what Einstein's theory predicts. Okay. I come back and tell you that. It's pretty cool. There's some nice pictures. That's a three and a half meter telescope at Apache Point. That's our giant green laser pointer blasting the moon. And there were people who thought that we blew up the moon in that picture was first posted online. So, <laughs> believe it or not. So, I'll stop there. There's a host of other recent experiments, the ones at Stanford. Gravity waves, we could go on talking about gravity wave experiments to. Um, but I'll, I'll just stop there. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>